I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler on this week's episode. We'll cover, is it time to panic for the 2022 recruiting class? Will Miles not in agreement with his own article right there. We got two transfers are on their way to Gainesville and a top 2022 prospect. Walter Nolan has narrowed his choices from five to three. We'll also discuss how Todd Grantham plans to turn the defense around this coming season. And we'll close out with our thoughts on the passing of Florida State legend Bobby Bowden. But first, Will, you have a message for the audience. Yeah, we just really want to say thank you. Everybody's really gotten engaged, helped us out. We've had a couple of people on Twitter encouraging people to subscribe. We are now 12 away from 1,000 subscribers, which, you know, you and I sort of at the beginning of the summer set a, set a goal to get to 1,000 by, by the time football season came along. And one of the things that's going to let us do is instead of putting stuff behind a paywall and that sort of stuff, uh, we can actually monetize the YouTube site. So please help us subscribe. We really appreciate your support, and uh, hopefully everybody's going to enjoy it as we do more and more video content throughout the fall. Yeah, thank you to everyone out there, and we'll continue to do the best we can to put out great content for you guys, but let's jump into two bits right now. Will, you posed the question last Friday in an article on Read and Reaction, is it time to panic about Florida's 2022 recruiting class? You specifically cited the example with Leighton Nelson, a three-star tackle from Orlando, committing to Central Florida over Florida and you said that it was referred to, to – someone referred to it to you as uh, the the equivalent of 2013 Georgia Southern. I'm just going to call that a vivid description and let you take over from here. Yeah, I mean, so this is Bill Sykes. So people know Bill from the uh, original versions of the Gators Breakdown podcast. Bill's a huge recruit, Nick, and, and has been sort of ringing the, ringing the alarm bells for, for Mullen for a while. And I mean, to be honest, he and I both have. I've written stuff back in his first offseason before he even played a game saying, hey, guys, this is, this is a little bit concerning. And it's not so much one recruit. I mean, you never want to judge a class by one recruit, which is why if he brings in Walter Nolan, um, you know, the second ranked guy overall and brings him in, I'm not I'm going to say that's a great get, but I'm not going to say that makes this a great class. Same thing with Nelson, like he's a three star tackle from Orlando, decides to go to Central Florida, has family ties to Central Florida. And you can you can excuse away missing a guy like Nelson, except for that. It was pretty clear Florida wanted him. And at some point the excuses get a little bit old. You got to start bringing in guys and building this class. And right now the average, the average recruiting rank for the class is around 15th. Um, I've had some people reach out to me and say, yeah, well, you know, if you delete the kicker, then that average goes up, but everybody else recruits kickers too. And I mean, basically, it, even if you get rid of the kicker, you just have an average recruiting class that's right on par with where Mullen has been the last four or five years. Again, I don't know that we need to expect him to have a fantastic class, but I think it's a little bit concerning that the classes do seem to sort of be creeping backwards over the last couple of years, as opposed to just maintaining the status quo, especially considering, you know, two and five versus LSU, Georgia, and Alabama, those teams that are recruiting at a higher level with Oklahoma and Texas coming to the conference. It's not going to get any easier over the next few years. And so, you know, some, some improvement needs to be made and that's something that hopefully Mullen will take care of. But at this point, you can't blame the assistants. You can't blame, um, you know, you can't blame the defensive coordinator. You can't blame anybody. I mean, at this point, it's a staff that Mullen's put together. They're recruiting using his methods of recruiting, using his planning, using his evaluations, and at the end of the day, you know, the the article for Leighton Nelson that came out talked about Hevesy and and uh, and Mullen spamming his phone and really sort of being disagreeable when he decided to go to UCF. And that that was the other thing is it was sort of an optics nightmare just to have somebody who's going to UCF all of a sudden basically make it sound like your program's begging. Now, again, is that a little bit of gamesmanship because he's not going to Florida? And so he decided to to sort of rile up his own fan base. Maybe, but you know, at the end of the day, you got to get three star guys. You can't let those guys go to UCF. Well, part of your concern too is you're looking. I you laid out a, a good chart here where you basically pointed out the number of committed players per ranking, and essentially, I, I, I mean, the further down you go, it looks like between 200 and 250, 86 percent of the players are committed, and between one and 50 in the rankings, 56 percent of the players are committed. So your point. In panicking, you're not just pulling the panic over one three-star recruit. You're just running out of numbers to add to the class. Yeah, I mean, the point is, is that you're not going to build a class 
that gets into the top five, top six, even top seven with guys ranked 300th because mm. one, there are only 14 of those guys left and Florida needs 14 more guys in their, in their recruiting class to get 25. Um, the other thing is, is that those guys don't really move the needle. So I guess it's sort of a good news, bad news thing, right? The good news is, is that there are more, are more guys ranked one through 50th and that Florida is in the running for a few of those guys. I already mentioned Nolan, you've got, you've got Evan Stewart, you've got a few other guys as well who are in the top 34 of the rankings who are really considering Florida. But even if they get their top six targets, you're still looking at a, at a recruiting ranking that finishes around sixth. And history tells us that Florida's probably going to get three of those guys, at least recent history under Dan Mullen. You get those three guys and you're sitting there maybe a little bit behind where he's been back in 18, 19, and 20. 21 took a little bit of a dip, not an appreciable dip in average player ranking, but now 2022 is a little bit lower than 2021. And so, you know, you got to start wondering, hey, is this a trend where we sort of leveled off and now things are starting to decay a little bit? Um, you know, especially coming off of three good years where the team played really, really well the last three years. To, to still have these struggles on the trail, I think, says something about the um, the ability of the, of the coaches to, to really – take the winning on the field and convert that into bringing in elite guys on the field. But um, again, I, we've sort of been saying this for a while that recruiting, we know isn't going to be up to Kirby smart or Nick Saban's level. Um, it's, it's an exercise now for Florida to see if Mullins on field acumen and development can overcome the overall recruiting rankings, which tend to reflect <laughs> in who plays in the playoff. We'll see. I mean, obviously uh, if, he, if he goes, it's go becoming ahead. a common theme on this show. That, that, well, that statement right there. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's, that's the problem though, right? Is that at a school like Florida, when you've won for three straight years, you shouldn't have to make that statement. It shouldn't be a, well, let's see if we can turn these three star guys into, into stars on the field, or let's see if we can mine the transfer panel or the transfer portal better than anybody else out there. Now Mullen has built up the talent through the transfer portal, and maybe that's going to be a saving grace, right? Is that, traditionally you've had to build through high school recruiting, but the transfer portal has really changed things. NIL has really changed things and maybe he's able to take the transfer portal and, and really leverage that to his advantage at the same time. Everybody else has the same advantage with the transfer panel. A couple of years ago when they brought in, when they brought in Trevon Grimes, when they brought in Van Jefferson, that was kind of a new thing to have guys come in, play right away and be, still have a couple of years of eligibility left. It's not a new thing anymore. And if you think Nick Saban's going to sit back and not use the transfer portal, if he has the opportunity to make his team better, well, Saban's going to start using it in the same way as well. Well, we saw he already grabbed one of the best linebackers coming into this year and Henry uh, Toe Toe. But, you know, I mentioned in the, in the, in your article too, about the article in the athletic that we had shared uh, where it was a great article for those of you who subscribe to the athletic, be sure to check it out. But it was basically talking about, why the state of Florida in general is struggling in recruiting. It's not just Florida, folks. Florida State, Miami, keeping the top talent in state. You're seeing Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State. Basically, they're recruiting the, the, the teams that are dominating recruiting across the country right now are also doing the same thing in Florida. But, Will, they're also doing it in Texas, California, like I said, across the country. What do you think Florida is lacking in terms of infrastructure right now to – to really compete with these playoff teams year in, year out? Or is it just recent success? Is it, it, it as soon as the Gators make that jump and get to the playoffs, they'll be among the big boys with the recruits? Uh, it's spending and it's sales. So Georgia spends almost twice as much as Florida does on recruiting on a, on a annual basis. That makes a big difference in terms of why they're able to out-recruit. Um, and then I think it's sales. I think Kirby Smart is a better salesman than Dan Mullen. That's pretty clear. Um, and you see the same thing with Saban, right? Saban walks into a room. We even saw it this week with Bobby Bowden. We'll get to him in a little bit. But all the stories about Bowden going into somebody's house and, you know, a little, you know, somebody's little sister falls asleep and, you know, he get he puts her head on his knee and all of a sudden the mother's like, oh, and all of a sudden the player's like, I think it was Andre Wadsworth said that, that, uh, you know, that all of a sudden he was like, well, I know I'm going to Florida State. <laughs> and, and so the ability to make that connection, to remember people, to to care honestly about people's families, all those sorts of things. I'm not saying Dan Mullen doesn't care. I'm saying that he has um, – he, he's sort of an awkward dude, even during like the, the press conferences and things, it doesn't necessarily flow naturally. It's not something he wants to do. He wants to go out there and coach football. And, and so, you know, that's great, right? We need someone who can go out there and, and drop the X's and O's. 
at the same time, part of the college job is building relationships and going out and selling. And so when you factor in the two components there, right, that maybe Mullen isn't quite as good a salesman as some of his contemporaries. And then the fact that Florida gets outspent by the guys who are out there coming into the state, right? I mean, one of the reasons they can come into the state is they're willing to spend the money. There's no opportunity cost, right? Because a flight into Florida is just money. And if you're willing to spend whatever you want, then what does it matter, right? Move, come into the state and, and rate it. Well, we, we do a lot of talking about the head coaches, Mullen and Smart and everything. At what point in the process do those guys actually get involved? So I'm, I, in infrastructure, I'm not just talking about uh, buildings or new, new weight rooms or whatever, but are, are we is, – is it leads from assistant coaches? Is it different connections that Alabama – I mean, clearly Georgia – is recruiting at another level than it was under Mark Rick. Like they recruited well under Rick, but they're, they want to notch up when Kirby went there. So there's something about that Alabama infrastructure that he clearly brought over with to him with Athens. Like, what are they doing? I'll always sit there and go, what are they doing that we're not? And I'm not even saying you have the answer right now. I don't mean to put you on a spot like this, but that's the question I sit there and ask when I read about all these articles about why are they getting these guys and we're not, I, I don't understand that part of the process. I'd like to understand that a little better. Yeah, I think it's actually interesting. You, you referenced the athletic article. One thing I'd encourage people to do when they go in there, they interviewed a couple of talent evaluators and a bunch of high school coaches and asked them about the different staffs. And if you look at how they, how they detail Mullen, it's almost a Jekyll and Hyde. Like there are coaches who just rave right. about him. And then there are coaches who are like, I don't, can't even get a text message. And I think that speaks to organization, right? I think that speaks to strategy. I think that speaks to saying, hey, I've got a high level strategy that I'm going to execute all the way down. And to have a coach who was from Jacksonville essentially say, you know, Miami comes up here and recruits Jacksonville better than Florida. Now, I think that's specific to that high school, but that's also an inexcusable statement to have from a high school coach in Jacksonville, in Jacksonville. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, maybe that coach has has an axe to grind, right? I mean, we have no idea who, who they right. are. Take it with a grain of salt. But, yeah. but the statement was made, right? Which means that there's a bunch of high school kids out there who feel like who are getting that information from their head coach who's basically saying you should go to Miami or you should go to Alabama or you should go to Clemson instead of Florida because Florida doesn't care about Jacksonville. That's an organizational thing. That's a how do you root your way in and build that relationship in that high school. And I'm sure, you know, every relationship has two sides. I'm sure there's a reason why Florida has chosen for that particular coach not to be all that responsive. But you have to be at least responsive enough that you don't get that you don't get blasted in an article in The Athletic where, you know, it just comes off as poor. Now, again, I mean, you go and read it. It's, it's so funny because one coach, you know, they do the homework on their players. When they want a player, they recruit him really, really hard. Jules Montanar is the recruiter in the area. Southwest Florida is generally under-recruited, and, and I think they do a good job there. But then, again, you, you know, Florida does a phenomenal job. A lot of the coaches' kids go to our school. We've had several kids play over there. So it's not as though it was all negative. But I think the fact that there was a there was negative with those sort of or positive with those sort of negative um, spots indicates that there's some blind spots there when they're when they're recruiting in their own state, which then makes you say, okay, a guy like Evan Stewart out in Texas, I absolutely think you should go after him. But a couple of years ago with Christopher Steele out in out in Los Angeles, you know, what have you sacrificed? by going out to California, especially when you're budget constrained. And I think that's a legitimate question to ask, right? That if you're going to go heavy after those big top 50 guys, you got to get them. They got to come in and they got to play well, because otherwise you're sort of, you, you have the opportunity to, to ostracize some of the more local guys who wish you were recruiting harder locally. That was one of your better thoughts in, in this article too, is I, I think you referenced him, uh, Mullen's issue with the NCAA and you're like, you referenced that it was in Seattle. You're like, I think I have more of a problem with the fact that it was in Seattle than he actually got caught doing anything by the NCAA. Well, people, is, get, people get mad at me about this, but you know, I have no problem with Florida cheating. I have a problem with them getting caught. We all know there's a bunch <laughs> oh, of stuff that goes on under the table, right? We all know that the NIL actually is probably going to pull that stuff up above, but there's always right. stuff that goes on underneath the table. And so, you know, the, the idea that, that the only places that are cheating are the guys who are beating you out for recruits, I think is, is, is not necessarily accurate. The other thing that drives me nuts is just the excuses, right? Like every time there's a recruit who chooses someplace else, it's like, well, you know, his, 
his dad preferred that school or whatever. And I, I tweeted at one point, I'm like, we're getting to the point now where the excuses are the old space balls thing. Like I'm your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate is the reason why the guy decided to go someplace else. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this isn't, you don't get paid the amount you get paid, the amount Dan Mullen's getting paid and get to just not be elite at one area or apparently you do. But, but but I'm not sure that it's going to work out all that well, or at least not work out well consistently. Doesn't mean Florida can't win the SEC championship. Doesn't mean they can't make the playoff. But what it means is, is that consistently doing that year after year after year, like if you're expecting a run like Spurrier or a run like Urban Meyer, I think they're going to need to see an uptick here. And I think there's probably ways they can do it. 2023 actually is off to a really, really good start. So maybe they've learned some things, maybe bringing in the defensive back coaches, Maybe Mullen's putting a little bit more into it and maybe 2023 will be a really good class, but um, 2022 looks like it's going to be about what we've gotten in the past or maybe a little bit worse. There's no chance that any coaching staff is universally beloved in state. However, you don't want to really hear out of a major market like Jacksonville that they're not hearing from the coach. So that, that, that's a little concerning, but a lot of mixed feedback in that article. There's a lot of good stuff too. So anyone who subscribes to the athletic, be sure to check that one out and be sure to check out Will's article on readingreaction.com. Let's move on to four bits here. Uh, all right. So we went a little hard after recruiting. Will. We'll, we'll, we'll collect ourselves here and reset for some more positive uh, news here. This past week, it was announced that two, two transfers are coming to Gainesville. Cornerback Elijah Blades from Texas A&M and offensive tackle Caleb Boateng from Clemson. Let's start with Blades, Will. Uh, he, he, he comes into Florida after originally being a Florida commit during his high school process. I think he's also committed to Oregon and uh, where else? He, one other school, Nebraska at one point. Ended up going the JUCO route, though. But flipped at the last second in Oregon and Texas A&M. Played a year at A&M. Ends up having a solid season in 2019. Started six games. But he, he, get, he got hurt. Ends up opting out of 2020. Uh, six foot two corner, four star prospect from Pasadena, California. And Will, he's not in camp yet, but he is expected to contribute right away and really should the secondary should be improved here in 2021 with this addition. Yeah, you would hope so. I mean, obviously, we've got the other transfer, Jadarius Perkins, who's coming in after a short sort of stopover at Missouri. Um, you've got Kyrie Elam on one side, pretty much locking that one down. And then you've got Perkins, potentially Blades, and then Jason Marshall um, competing on the other side, along with Jaden Hill. Um, you know, you've got, for all of his leaping ability, Marco Wilson was only six feet tall. And so against larger receivers, you know, Caleb Chapman, six foot five for Texas A&M last year, um, he was struggling with the ball in the air. Right. And, and so it's interesting that Perkins, Blades, Mar Blade and Marshall are all six two. They're bigger guys. Um, and, and so Florida is going to have probably three guys now who are sort of interchangeable in terms of what they want to do. Now, obviously, each of these guys is going to have his own skill set. But that's one of the things that uh, Todd Grantham was actually mentioning this week in some of his interviews was that he wanted to make sure that the defensive backs got better with the ball in the air. But let's be honest, a couple extra inches is sometimes all it takes if you're not the small guy who kind of looks like he's having to jump on a giant on a giant receiver's back it helps out to have that extra couple inches and, and if you can knock a few more down then obviously the defense is going to get better just because you've got that extra size all right caleb botank 6'4, 315 out of fort lauderdale high school former three-star commit to clemson played sparingly in two seasons i don't i don't think he played much last year he played a little more in 2019 it sounds like well, he's been in the transfer portal since February. I found that interesting. I, I know Twitter has been a buzz with uh, going after John Hevesy this week. Do you think some of the misses, the Leighton story we just talked about in particular, do you think that impacted the decision to bring him in now? I mean, I think obviously the numbers have to make sense, right? I mean, you got to have the right number of scholarships, the right number of initial counters, all those sorts of things. And one of the risks to using the transfer portal is, is that you sort of tighten that the numbers game, right? And, and you got to make sure you've got the right numbers before you bring somebody in. So you wait until you know exactly who you think is going to come in from your board. And then you can, and then you can bring somebody in. You probably also wait and see what you've got either in the spring or in fall camp. Um, you know, I don't think there've been any injuries, but if you've got a couple of guys who are nicked, maybe you bring in somebody to help as well. 
You know, Boating's interesting. He was a three-star recruit ranked in, I think, the 900s. Decides to go to Clemson, but most of his offers were not were not Clemson quality. Um, he played 26 career snaps over five games in 2020 and 2019. Um, so he's still got a couple of years of eligibility left, which is nice. But at the same time, not somebody who's got a lot of Division One Power 5 experience at this point. But – within a major program, right? So if you're, if you're looking at, you know, where would you want to bring somebody in? I mean, if you have the opportunity to get a guy who's learned under Nick Saban or guys learned under Dabo Swinney, I think those are good places to go. And if you look at 24 sevens sort of projection, they projected him as an FBS contributor, so not an NFL level lineman. So he's physical and plays tough, good athleticism, has a nasty side. He's an interior offensive lineman, has a good initial punch, but, um, you know, has to work on knee bend to be more explosive to snap um, upper body strength needed. So, you know, again, if he's added upper body strength, if he's improved his footwork, then you could see somebody who would be a contributor, but offensive line is such a continuity position that I don't think this is necessarily a 2021 acquisition, right? I, I think because offensive line is, is built on continuity because, you know, Florida for the most part, I think kind of knows who their offensive line is going to be unless there's a major rash of injuries. I don't know the boat is going to be somebody that, that necessarily makes major contributions this year. Maybe I'm wrong, right? I mean, blades, we expect him to step right in. Why wouldn't we expect that from, from this guy? Well, blades played major playing time at an sec school last year and is now coming in. That's not the same thing that, that, that oh, we've seen. From offensive lines is completely different. It's much easier to step in in the secondary. I feel on that too. I feel like that's a, that's a great point on your, well, on we your saw that. There. We saw that last year, with Stuart Reese, right? You bring in Stuart Reese from Mississippi state. Everybody's like, Oh, he's going to do a great job. You know, he knows Dan Mullen's system, all that sort of stuff. Well, first off he knew Dan Mullen's system with Dick Fitzgerald at, at quarterback which was very different than Dan Mullen's system with Kyle Trask at quarterback and then the other thing is is that they didn't have any sort of spring practice right and so there was no real way to integrate and build that continuity and consequently I do think that Reese struggled quite a bit so you know um, Gene DeLance gets a lot of criticism and many times it's deserved but at the same time um, you know Reese wasn't all wasn't great shakes on the right side of the offensive line either and so um, I do think that there's probably going to be some advancement there and that's probably what you're looking for for Boateng is they've seen some stuff on film or they know some stuff from high school or you know he's he's sort of fixed some of the things that maybe people saw when he was coming out of high school and is going to be a contributor but probably not in 2021. All right, let's move on to five-star defensive tackle. Walter Nolan narrowed down his choices to his top three. Florida made the cut along with Tennessee and Texas A&M. Michigan, Alabama are out of the running. The Tennessee native, he was thought to have interest in, in, in the Wolverines because he has family ties up in the Detroit area I was reading about, but ends up with the final three being in the SEC, including his backyard in Tennessee. Tennessee stayed in the hunt there, Will. How are we feeling about Walter Nolan's chances? Do you have expectations now? I mean, obviously being one in three is great. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think it's hard to pull somebody out of their home state. That'll be the excuse this time if he decides to stay home. I don't know what the excuse is if he goes to Texas A&M. Um, you know, so from an optics perspective, it'd be better if he stayed home in Tennessee than if he goes to A&M. Um, and then obviously from an optics perspective, it'd be great if he comes to Florida. I, I think anytime you make it in the top three for a five-star candidate, that's a big deal, right? I, I don't want to poo-poo that. But you got to close the deal because being in the top three doesn't mean anything. It doesn't come to your university. So it's great that they're in the top three. It's great that they've built that relationship with Nolan and hopefully they can close the deal and bring him in because him next to Gravon Dexter would That's, be, would be pretty cool. Keep picturing him and Dexter together up the middle. That would be very stout next year that, that would be playoff that's that's the type of that's the type of dude that could get you to the next level into the playoffs yeah well especially with the linebackers it was interesting today i, I read an article where they were interviewing diabate and he was basically saying they were talking about the new defensive tackles who's tra who've transferred in um shelton and newkirk and and he was like yeah last year we were getting mauled He's like, those guys up front now are keeping the offensive linemen off of us. And I was like, wow, that's about as direct a shot as you'll <laughs> see fired at, at former teammates. But, uh, you know, so if you, can, if you can bring Nolan in, and this has always been the case with, with Grantham, is that elite defensive tackle play 
opens up the pass rushing on the outside, but more than anything, it helps out your linebackers and your defensive backs so much when you're able to get pressure up the middle and make the quarterback uncomfortable. That's where all the turnovers come from. And for all the sacks that Florida has been able to manufacture over the last three years, they haven't done a whole lot of pushing the pocket up into the quarterback's face. It's been guys coming off of the edge and, and sometimes that's effective, but when you miss, when you come off the edge and there's no pressure coming up the middle, the quarterback can step up in the pocket and usually is able to find a guy who's open. That's happened a lot, especially last year. So, uh, you know, big time pass rush up the middle, big time push up the middle is a big deal. Nolan can help with that. And so obviously he's a big, he's a big deal if they could bring him to Gainesville. Walter Nolan, folks, keep your eye on it. Let's move on to six bits and really expand what you just started on there, Will. Ethan Hughes of Gator Country, he wrote a good piece this week on Todd Grantham detailing plans to turn the defense around for 2021. I'll put the link in the show notes for everyone. He started out with this question. So how exactly do you take perhaps the worst defense in program history and transform it into a team strength without any major personnel coaching changes? or coaching, personnel or coaching changes. And Grantham identified three primary areas of improvement that he believes will result in a much better performance in 2021. One, improve the stoutness in the running game and get to the quarterback on a more consistent basis. That's a shot at the defensive line right there. Two, make plays when the ball is in the air. We saw that several times last year. This one is obviously directed at the secondary. Hughes pointed it out. First interception didn't come until the Georgia game last year. It was game five for those of you counting at home. And three, play with more cohesion or synergy. Grantham obviously pointed to the fact that, you know, there's COVID 2020. That wasn't exactly a, a great time for the team to come together. It was difficult to build chemistry last year. And you really felt like that hurt the Gators, even though other schools were dealing with the same thing. No doubt it hurt other schools too, but that, that's an easy thing to point out right now. But overall, I mean, I, this is a pretty basic prescription. Wouldn't you say, well, get a better pass rush, make turn, create turnovers? Like, I, I mean, I, I didn't hear anything uh, earth shattering in these descriptions. No, I mean, it's it's a lot of coach speak, right? I, yeah. I think the, the one thing maybe you could pick apart is the cohesion. Um, you know, the fact that he's talking about unit cohesion. You know, COVID obviously made things weird, but it, but it was weird for everyone. And, and for him to cite cohesion indicates he didn't think the defense played together very well. And that, that to me, though, is a coaching problem, right? That's one of those things where you've got guys in the field who aren't doing what they should. And so there need to be new players on the field. And I get what he's saying, and I agree with that principle, but you, you can't have cohesion when nobody's being held accountable for their mistakes, right? You can't expect the left – the left defensive end to trust and do his job when the defensive tackle is not doing his job and then a play gets blown up, or you can't expect the linebacker to stay in his gap when there's a pulling guard coming around in his gap and he has to dodge that guy all the time. You can't expect the safety to play the coverage he's supposed to play when he's not sure whether the corner is going to play the right coverage. And all of a sudden you have a busted coverage and things are wide open. We saw a lot of that last year. It's not a surprise that someone would call out cohesion, but Grantham's the guy who can do something about it, which is, I think, one of the reasons why a lot of people expected a change to happen after this year. And yeah, defensive tackle play needs to get better. They brought in guys who can who can potentially do that. Yeah, the guys need to do a better job of high point the ball in the air. They need to get turnovers when they've got the opportunity and all that sort of stuff. And if they've got multiple options out there to where they can pull guys in and out, then the unit cohesion should improve just because you're going to be held accountable. So all those things are, are true, but like you said, I mean, it, it's at the end of the day, you're going to have to be tougher than your opponent. You can't just allow them to go up and down the field the way they did last year. And, you know, I mean, yeah, cohesion, but I think a little bit of pride too, right? Having the pride to not go out there and, and, and making sure everybody does their job and trust maybe is a better word where you got to trust that the guy next to you is going to do what he's supposed to do and trust your coaches that if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, then they're going to put somebody in there who will. I'll throw in another word there, and I know we, we're basically touching on it when you talk about cohesion and synergy, but communication. How many times last year did we see the defense seemingly scrambling at the last second? I, was it the Kentucky game that someone took a still shot of basically the entire defense being in it, almost like over center at one point when Kentucky's lined up ready to snap the ball? 
Well, that's how you get like 91% fourth down conversion. (laughs) That's what what they gave up last year. It was something ridiculous like that. Yeah, I want to, you want to see game one and game two, especially FAU USF lined up ready to go, lined up ready to go when the ball snapped. I like, you don't want to see a bunch of moving around in, in there. I think if we see that, if you're seeing that in game one and game two, I'm going to be a little nervous uh, I'm actually, I'm, this season. I'm actually okay if people don't line up appropriately. I'm not okay if they're out there for the next play. Right? Like, you can tolerate mis- – like, mistakes are going to So you're to not happen. okay with it because you would pull them for lining up inappropriately. Well, but, I'm, but I don't blame Grantham for it happening the first time. Right. I blame Grantham for not pulling the guy off the field. Correct him. Who continues to make the mistake. Right. And then putting him back out there without him learning his lesson that he can't make that mistake. And, and that's what happened last year, right? I mean, it's not that Marco Wilson threw the shoe, though that one – is ridiculous it's that he was still out there on the next play and the rest of the drive like at that point you know there needs to be consequences when there are when there are um plays that go outside the bounds of what's acceptable and and i i said the thing is is that the the shoe throw was terrible in terms of what it meant but it had been built up throughout the year right because you saw a lot of guys who hadn't necessarily been doing their jobs but had been allowed to stay out there and you can make arguments that, well, you know, they didn't have a spring practice and the young guys weren't ready and all that sort of stuff. All of that is true, but that game against Texas A&M, like I had somebody send me a note that was basically like there were, they had the one fumble that Stewart punched out the ball on a little slant route, even though it was a third down conversion, I think, but he still punched the ball out. So Florida gets the ball back. That was like 60 yards that Texas A&M didn't get. Other than that, out of all the possible yards they could have gotten. So, like, if you get a kickoff and you take the ball at the 25 right. and you and you can go 65 or what would that be, 75 yards to score a touchdown, like, they came up, like, three yards short of the maximum they could have on all the <laughs> other drives. And that was just because Florida happened to stop them for a field goal at the end of the half because they ran out of clock. And so, you know, the, the point that the guy who sent that to me was making was, how much worse could it be if you brought in the young guys? Like, the old guys just right. got absolutely rolled over. Why not see what you got? And I got to say, I, I didn't have a real good argument back against that one. Well, you, you threw out the comment by diabetic too, where, where he's talking about the uh, uh, defensive tackle transfers and everything. And the defensive play up front is really going to key this whole thing. It, it could really transform this defense heading into 2021. But I think we're going to find out a lot in games one and game two. This is the point. I, I don't think it's going to take a long time to see a difference there. Will you think I'm putting too much stock in those first two games? No, I mean I think we saw last year, right? I mean, Ole Miss was not Ole Miss was a pretty good team last year, but they offense was great, absolutely. But yeah. they weren't they weren't world beaters. And then we all of a sudden see South Carolina and Florida can't get off the field against the Gamecocks either. You didn't need to tell me that this was going to be a problem after that. It was okay. How can it improve? What are they doing wrong? But at the same time, you looked at when. Like after the old Michigan game, you're like, well, maybe Lane Kiffin just has them rolling and, you know, next week it'll be much, much better. And then against South Carolina, you're like, yeah, they converted like, you know, 80% of their third downs and were on the field. Now, granted, it was, it was great because it was the classic must champ. I'm going to do a lot of things that frustrate the opposition, but I'm going to run the clock out and not be able to come back and win the game. But the offense bailed them out over and over and over last year. And we saw that early on. I think you trust your eyes, right? I mean, you trust what you see, and and it's not as though, um, I mean, uh, Florida Atlantic is is they took a major step back last year under Taggart after Kiffin left, but you know USF, I know you're you're real high on the coach there at USF. You think he's a pretty good guy, pretty good coach. Um, they still might need some time to develop that program. I think that roster's got a long way to go, but I think Jeff Scott, uh, former Clemson offensive coordinator, I think he I think he's going to build something there. Yeah. So, I mean, but again, I, I think it's still, it's a, it's a power five team or not a power five team, but it's a, group it's a, five. Yeah. it's a group of five team. They're a quality team. It doesn't mean that they're going to go 13 and zero in in their conference, but it, but it does mean that the, I'm guessing they'll probably be around 500. And so that doesn't mean that Florida shouldn't beat them, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's closer in the first half than people expect, especially since it's going to be like 5 trillion degrees outside. You just don't want to see the silly mistakes early. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the difference. I, I don't care if they put – if FAU or USF puts a good drive together here or there, but just the silly mistakes that you saw last year that led to the giant plays. And that, that's the type of stuff I want to see. I want to see the defense set. 
I want to see, like you said, if there's mistakes made, get the guy off the field, get the next guy up, and like just get that rotation down until you find that right formula. And as bad as last year was, 2019 wasn't that bad on defense. 2018 wasn't that terrible on defense. I'm hoping for uh, reverting back to those times. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's all going to come down to pass rush and really pressure up the middle. Those defensive tackles play well. That's the thing I think you should probably look for in the first couple of games is if the defensive tackles are getting a push up the middle, um, you know, you usually put your your lesser skilled offensive linemen in the center, right? The center and the guards are usually less skilled than your tackles, which means if you've got a real advantage at defensive tackle, it gives you a significant advantage against every offense that you play. But like your defensive tackles aren't going to take a game off, right? It's, it's a strength game. It's an explosion game. It's a speed game coming off the ball. And so, you know, if, if you see that in the first couple of games, I think that's a really encouraging sign that, that Florida's defense is going to be much improved. Yeah, I need to talk myself into upsetting Alabama by then, so I need to see it the first two games, guys. Let's see it. All right, let's move on to a dollar, Will. 34-year head coach at Florida State University, Bobby Bowden, passes away on Sunday at the age of 91. And I know we don't spend much time as a fan base in general showering compliments on any anything in Garnet Gold, but I think Bobby Bowden is an exception. And regardless of how you feel about FSU – in my mind, it was always easy to admire and root for Coach Bowden to, you know, do – like, the guy. The guy's an absolute legend, and he just did it the right way in a lot of ways. He had plenty of fire. Like, it wasn't just that he was a good guy. He also had plenty of fire. And I know a lot of Gator fans we, – we, I saw a couple of comments out there about hitting to the whistle and everything. We saw, we saw a couple of those out there. But – he just had an ease about himself and a way with people which few college football coaches really possess back then and today. And he was the ultimate what you see is what you get type of guy. And, and I think that's really his legacy is that I think he just knew how to treat people. And you don't, you don't really hear a bad word about the guy at any point. And I think that says a lot about him as a guy in that position and, you know, obviously he built a monster out in Tallahassee, Will. I just want to throw a couple stats out there. In the 22-year history before Bobby Bowden, Florida State had only been in the rankings four times. They never finished in the season. They never finished the season ranked, though. But Bowden goes to FSU, and we've just listened to UCF go back and forth with us over the last couple of years about this two-for-one nonsense where they finally settled in on it. But Bowden willed FSU to the top of college football in some ways. He, he – basically put the program through the ringer. They signed up for six consecutive trips to LSU before LSU decided to return a trip to, to Florida state. And in 1981, they took five straight road games in a row, like five in a row at Nebraska, at Ohio state, at Notre Dame, at Pitt, as in the number three Pitt Panthers with Dan Marino, not today's Pitt. national championship competing Pitt, Dan Marino finishing as a Heisman finalist. And then LSU. Five weeks in a row. I don't know many coaches that would sign up for that. And I think that says a lot about the character of the man. No, I, I think you did an excellent job over a read and reaction with your with your dedication or your article to, to, to Bowden. Um, I think it's interesting to see sort of how he responded to some of C. Spurrier's barbs. I love that you yeah. sort of said that the Spurrier-Phil Fulmer dynamic was like Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. And Bowden just sort of dealt with, the, uh, with Spurrier's quips and was always very complimentary of Steve. And I think yeah. part of that is because they had so much respect for each other. You know, the interesting thing is, is that as much as Fulmer is, is fun to make fun of, the the when Fulmer had that Tennessee program going, that was fun. And when Bobby Bowden, as much as we disliked those Florida State teams and, you know, the the sort of the attitude and the swag that they the swagger that they brought and those sorts of things, it was fun to know that at the end of the year, like everybody always makes fun of Florida for not playing games outside of the state of Florida. We didn't need to. An SEC schedule followed up by Florida State on Thanksgiving weekend mm -hmm. meant that you had played one of the toughest, if not the toughest schedule in the country. And Florida State was a big part of that. You know, it's funny. You look back at those two teams. And in the 90s, basically the team that won that game was playing for the championship. And they were in the top 10, I think, for every game in the 1990s. And they were in like the top eight for all but for all but one. There was one where I think Florida State was ranked 10th, or I think Florida was ranked 10th in 97, which is actually like the best game ever played in the swamp, is sort of the, the way that was described. And you know, the reality is is that that is 
Bowden's ability to build the program, his ability to take on anybody and his ability to look long range, because the only way you take those games, those consecutive road games is if you have complete confidence in yourself and you say, one, we're going to win these games, but two, I'm building for 1982, 1983 and 1984. Right. So Florida state now doesn't have to do any of that stuff because Bobby Bowden did it 20 years ago or 30 years ago now. And you know, but that means he had to take a long-term view at the program. Right. And that's something that one coaches don't really get the opportunity to do these days, but two, you have to have a supreme confidence in your ability to do. And Bowden had that and, uh, and was able to sort of relay that confidence to his players. And, and obviously Florida state with three national championships, um, you know, pretty significant program. The, the scheduling thing, I understand the economics of the sport will never allow that to happen again uh, in terms of five straight road games. It's just economically, that will never happen again. So that's not just that coaches don't want to take that on. I just found that to be an anomaly when I was looking through their schedules. Uh, I actually, actually found that stat during the Charlie Pell, my Charlie Pell research, and I was just blown away looking at their schedule that year. But, I mean, if you go through a whole 80s with FSU, they took trips to Michigan. They went everywhere. They went everywhere to build that program. And I think Bowden did a fantastic job out there. And it's like you said, it's all, look, FSU is almost like a sibling rivalry. Like, I, I don't know many people that went to Georgia. I have a ton of friends that went to Florida State. Like, I, I, I hate losing to Florida State – because you got to hear about it more often. But it's not like where Georgia – I don't know a ton of Georgia. I don't know a ton of LSU fans. I know a ton of Florida State fans. So, believe me, I want to beat Florida State. Not trying to be overly complimentary of Florida State in any way, shape, or form. But Bobby Bowden did it the right way, man. And that's what, like, a lot of – we've seen – I one of the things I talked about in our art, in the article that I wrote was we've seen a lot of things, you know, our, our entire – my entire childhood for baseball. None of those guys are getting in the Hall of Fame right now. Like all these things that were that you thought were one thing that turned out to be another thing, Bobby Bowden is is like stood true. He stood true to the test of time. And I mean, they, you look back at some things. I know we're going revisiting some conversations with NIL. Like will Reggie Bush get his Heisman back? I think he still had some wins stripped from that uh, academic scandal that occurred at FSU. I'd like to see that corrected at some point and uh, put Bobby Bowden back on top uh, as for the all time wins total. But uh, Bowden just it, it, him and Spurrier dynamic. I don't know if you'll ever see anything like that again uh, with Florida and Florida State. Will? Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll get to that in the bonus. Actually, that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. the The thing that the thing that struck me about Bowden is that he was open about his faith and that he never really changed in in terms of that. I mean, so there, there's this there's a great documentary out there that looks at you know Florida State had an offensive lineman Pablo Lopez who was shot and killed, and Bowden got the team together and basically evangelized to him about his faith right after that base. And that really sort of changed the trajectory of Mark Rick's life. And I'm sure some of the other guys in there as well, that's a really interesting story. And then there's a story that you relate in the article where he, in your article, where he had essentially might have been one, the head coach at Marshall when the plane went down mm -hmm. back in, what was that? The 1970s, 1970. Yeah. Yeah, so the plane goes down at Marshall and he had been getting recruited to be the coach there at Marshall and decided to turn him down because he thought that he had better, he could, he would get a better offer and Florida state turned out to be that offer. But I think he never really sort of forgot that, you know, that he had this faith that somebody else was looking out for him. And that wasn't necessarily that, you know, Oh, basically that he had an opportunity that he might not have had otherwise and that he was going to take advantage of it because he had supreme confidence in, in where he was going. And, and you saw that in the last couple of weeks when they announced that he had a terminal disease, he said he was at peace and really that he was comfortable with where he was going. And that all sort of tracks back to his faith, which I think grounded sort of his attitude, which I think grounded the way he ran his program. And yeah, anytime you've got a college football program, I mentioned it earlier, right? College football programs cheat. It's not a, that's not a, not a, you know, I don't think that's a controversial statement. I'm sure there were times that things got bl blurred around the edges while Bowden was in charge. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is it's clear when you look at his players that they cared about him and that he cared about them. And all these stories that you've seen over the last week or so, ever since that announcement was made of them relaying him coming into their house and him being like a father to them and, you know, him relaying his faith to them and, and all that sort of stuff. I have a much, 
I have a much deeper appreciation for Bobby Bowden now as a person reading some of the tributes than I did uh, where I was just appreciative of his ability to keep that Florida, Florida state rivalry going and then happy that he left and, uh, you know, allowed Florida to sort of take over once Urban Meyer was, was in Gainesville. Well, that was before he left. That was before he left, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I was, it was kind of the reason he left. Yeah. Well, I was thinking through the book of Proverbs and, uh, I don't remember if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying being in there. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, Different people have different interpretations, right? We we all sin. The question is, did we win college football games when we were doing it? So, um, you know, I think Florida fans are always going to be a little bit dubious for some of the accolades that are sent that are sent Bowden's way. But I don't think you can deny the success that he had at Florida State, the way he built that program. And uh, you know, again, you look at you look at large programs with sort of the giant patriarchs at the top, and and a lot of them have had have had falling out or things where we've, you know, stories have leaked out about, about, you know, either a lack of integrity or having scandals that sort of bring them down. At the end of the day, the thing that brought down Bobby Bowden is that Urban Meyer came to town and Florida State wasn't winning often enough. And Jimbo Fisher was sort of waiting in the wings to take over. And, and it's interesting, you know, we've sort of experienced this at Florida with Will Muschamp and, and then Jim McElwain, which is that you get lucky when you have a coach who comes into your program, who's an icon and has the ability to sort of take your program to the next level, that that's something that we shouldn't necessarily take for granted. And I think Florida state over the last few years with Willie Taggart and then, and then with Norvell here, we'll see, but you know, the idea that Jimbo Fisher, I think is a very, very good head coach. I don't know whether he's, he's certainly not at Bowden's level. And then you have Bowden for 30 years before that. That's, that's really a blessed existence as a Florida state fan. I hope that they've taken some time over the last couple of weeks to really appreciate what they had because, uh, because otherwise it might've been just a, and they might be right back there. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's been an, four or five, six years since Florida state's really been even reasonably relevant. And, you know, depending upon how Nor- Norvell does, he could be their McIlwain where, you know, Taggart was the must champ Norvell's the McIlwain. And then does the program have the ability to rebuild from that? Because Florida has the sec Florida state doesn't necessarily have that. And so some of the magic of, of Bobby Bowden was that he built Florida state as an independent. They joined the ACC, but they really were the ACC for an extended period of time, Mm -hmm. helped build that into a, into a conference that has now been able to sort of be one of the standard bearers who always sends a team to the playoffs. Um, You know, but is it strong enough to survive without a guy like Bowden at the helm? That's something we're going to find out. Well, it was good run 91 years. That's a, that's a, that's a very good run. Great coach and a better man. Rest in peace, Coach Bound. Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. And check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. And as always, go Gators.